So turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 6, and we are going to look at the story that's right after what we talked about last week. So let me remind you, we are looking at the Sea of Galilee, and it can usually be a beautiful, placid lake, three times the size of Diamond Lake, not that big. And I've gone down there early in the morning like this and just seen the, the beautiful side of the lake. And, uh, and yet in the story we are in, remember Jesus had sent the 12 out and they had had to go on faith alone without any extra bag or staff or clothes and had to live by faith. And they came back and they were excited but exhausted. And then Jesus hears about John the Baptist, his dear friend, getting beheaded by a terrible circumstance of the request of a dancing girl, and all of a sudden this great man of God gets killed over something ridiculous, and that's, that's on his heart. So they, they had already set aside a time to pull away and rest and restore, and they got interrupted by 12,000 people. Have you ever had that day? You really wanted a day off, and all of a sudden everything in the world comes in, and they're on the other side trying to find a little peace and quiet, and all of a sudden there's this crowd, and it says Jesus had compassion on them, and he moves, and he then leads them through this incredible experience of teaching all day, and then handing out food, and then collecting the, the scraps left over. But if you were already tired before that, how do you think you'd feel after that? You know, even good stress is stress, isn't it? Even wonderful things drain you. And so that's where they are, and it says that they're still on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They tried to find a getaway, so now they're gonna head back across. And it says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. And while he dismissed the crowd and after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Jesus said, the gauges are on empty. It's time to send the disciples away. It's time to maybe even do a little flanking movement where he sends the crowd away, gets the disciples going, and then he needs to go spend some time with his father. He needs to restore and renew. He is also human. In his humanness, he's exhausted. So he, he is setting this up, and he tells him, I'll see you in Bethsaida. Now remember, they're already in a bad way. They're already exhausted, and they are now heading into what they hope is going to be a time of quiet and respite and calm. And guess what they walk into? A storm. A huge storm, actually. So it says, later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land, and he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake and he was, as he was about to pass by them. So, have you ever noticed that everything is worse in the middle of the night? I mean, there may be some things that bug you, some things that are kind of on your heart, some things that are concerning, but somehow at three o'clock in the morning when you wake up and you can't do anything but think about them, they all seem exaggerated. Now, I want you to think about this story in terms of the fact that the disciples were exhausted. They had already been through a storm in chapter four. But the difference in chapter four is guess who's in the boat with them? Yeah, they had already been through round one. So they had learned that part that when Jesus is with you, you're okay. Now they're out there in the middle and there is no Jesus and they're already exhausted. And I, I saw a reconstruction, actually it's the it's a copy of the kind of fishing boat that the disciples would have been in that was buried in the mud at the Sea of Galilee and they were able to get it out of the mud and float it and restore it and plasticize it and it's now in a museum there. And let me tell you, this was not a very big boat. And it doesn't really matter how big the waves are if you're in a tiny boat, okay? It, it makes it a storm. And so they are here in the middle and they are terrified. Now I can relate to this a little bit because I have a great boat story. So years ago, we went down to not our usual place for Mexican missions, which is on the Baja and on the Pacific side. We went all the way down to the middle of Baja, we crossed over, and we were on the Sea of Cortez. So we were in a little place called Bahia de los Angeles. And it was a wonderful little fishing village. We were trying to help get a church started there. And so we were there for a whole week, and it was, kind of an unreal, it's like weird cacti and then beautiful ocean views. 
And so we were out there, and one of the guys thought, in our spare time, we should go out and go fishing, which is always a good idea. Only he brought a nice inflatable pontoon boat. And we should have had our first clue because he pumped it up and then left it out there overnight, and in the morning it was deflated. That should have been one clue for us. But he said, don't worry, I'll patch it. I know where the hole is. I'll take care of this. And this is a pontoon boat that's probably designed for 10 people, 12 people, something like that. And so it wasn't very big. And so uh, about three days after we were there, we had an afternoon free, beautiful sunny day. So we headed out across out of the little lagoon and out into the Sea of Cortez proper. And they're running us out there with a little electric motor and we're, you know, out through and it was placid and the sun is out and the fish weren't biting. But other than that, it was a good day. And, And we thought, this is so nice and it just seems so easy going out. And then we thought we better get back because we had a program that evening and we need to be back. So we turned around and we realized part of why it was so easy going out is there was wind blowing us out. Now, wind does never seem very strong when you're going with it. When you're going against it, it's a lot stronger. And so we started coming back and realized that there's these little waves and, uh, you know, they weren't that big. But what happens when you put a little pressure on an inflatable boat that is not that seaworthy is it started folding up on us because the air was going out of the pontoons. And so as it starts folding up on us, it was like, every man, man your stations. So me and a guy named Bob were up at the front, and we were holding down the front, which was a wet place because every time you hit a wave, it came right in your face. So we're holding down the front. There's a couple of other guys holding the transom up at the back because as the boat folds, the motor goes out of the water, which is not very helpful. So they're holding the motor down in there, and then Scott is sitting in the middle of the boat, and he's holding our little battery charger, which is trying to keep the battery up that's running the boat. And he's trying to keep it out of the salt water, and he's trying to keep it cooked to the battery. And then there were a couple people actually trying to row. So we're going, and you know what? It seems like you don't make any progress when you're straining against the wind. So we're going and going and going, and we're thinking, we're doing okay. And then you look up and you think, it's just as far as it was before. And you know what happens when a boat is deflating? It gets more and more deflated. Oh, and Scott was holding, that's what he was holding. He was holding a battery-powered inflator to try to put air back into the boat. Only then, about the middle of that time, the water came over the edge, and that battery, in, uh, the, the inflator went into the water, and it didn't work anymore after that. So we weren't getting any more water, any more air in the boat. We were getting a lot more water in the boat. And you start calculating in your mind, can I swim that far? Hmm. Because it looks like we're going to get wet here. And you start thinking about what's floating in the boat. And isn't it interesting that in a storm, it's not any one thing that gets you. It's the culmination of all kinds of things adding up. And so we're up there at the front, me and Bob, and Bob is laughing hilariously. Every time this wave goes, he's like, ha, 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 ha. And, you know, we're getting, and I think this guy's sort of crazy, but we're moving on in, and he's a big buff guy, and we get finally outside of the Sea of Cortez and into the lagoon, and it finally settles down a little bit. And by the time we get to shore, that boat is just about worthless. And Scott, sitting in the middle of the boat, he said, you know, I would have been so afraid, except I figured, how bad can it be if Bob is still laughing? (laughs) To which Bob replied, I always laugh when I'm hysterical. <laughs> so I have, I have a little feeling for what this must have been like. Only, you know what? Did you catch the details of this story? They hand out the food at supper time. They take in the food after that, after feeding 12, 15,000 people, which isn't done in a heartbeat. And then they get into a boat and they head out. And it says that they were out there in the middle of the lake in the middle of the night. And Jesus sees them, but they can't see Jesus. And then if you catch the time frame on this, it says, and in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land, he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them shortly before dawn. How long were they out there in the storm in the middle of the night? All night long. You know, every hour when you're in the middle of a storm seems like 14. Why didn't Jesus just rescue him right off? Why didn't he zip out there and save the day and make everything go away? And I think this is a very important lesson 
is that God is far more interested in my comfort or my faith than he is my comfort. And sometimes when God doesn't fix our comfort, we think he doesn't love us. We think he doesn't know. We think he didn't see what was going on. And the reality is, is that God has a high value for building our faith. And faith is not built well in the shallows. Faith is not built in the comfortable. Faith is not built in the green pastures and the still waters. Faith is built in the valley of the shadow of death. Faith is built in the storm. Faith is built in the struggle. And it says, shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake, and he was about to pass by them. Did you catch that before? So here he sends them on a lake. He's keeping an eye on them. It says they're straining at the oars. Some of these guys were fishermen. You know, this wasn't like brand new to them, but they had worked all night against the waves after they were already exhausted. This was like a point of, I am completely done. And it says it, he acted like he was about to pass by them. And then what happened? It says, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. So things can get any worse. Here's Jesus and they think he's a spirit. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. I think there's a really powerful picture here. He made it as though he were gonna go by them because he wanted them to call him out. In fact, one of the most basic names for people who are lovers of God is it says in the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, they call on the name of the Lord. And I think sometimes we do everything else when we hit a crisis. When we're in the middle of a storm, we look to the news, we look to the government, we look to our own resources, we look to our neighbors. We, we often look everywhere else. And I think Jesus is saying, do you want me to be a part of this? You want me to be a part of this storm that you're in? So he acts like he's walking by and they cry out to him. And immediately he says, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down and they were completely amazed. Now, there are lots of things we can learn about this storm. It says they were completely amazed and then it goes on and adds one more little part. For they had not understood about the loaves because their hearts were hardened. They hadn't understood the power of Jesus demonstrated in the loaves and fishes so therefore, they were more terrified than they should have been on the storm. Meaning that the storms you're in now are supposed to be informed by the way that you've seen God work in the storms of the past. That we're not supposed to start at zero every time. We're supposed to be adding our understanding and growing our faith and developing. So let's talk about what does that mean for us right now. Uh, we're in a storm, in case you had noticed. We're in a storm of the virus, but that's only one little part of the storm. We're also in a storm of fear and hysteria. We're also in a storm of anger and people attacking each other and responding back and forth and a, a storm of response to the storm. We're also in a financial storm. You may have noticed Dow Jones has been crashing like crazy. We are in a storm of all of the individual parts. And a couple weeks ago, it was theoretical. This week, it's real. I've got friends that have been in the hospital. This is now hitting our shores. This is now impacting us. And so, here's my observation about storms. Storms tend to make you ever so much more so what you already were. Let me say that again. Storms tend to make you ever so much more so what you already were. If you're already a fearful person, what happens when you hit a storm? Woo! It goes to a high level. What happens if you're kind of a cranky, angry, the government's all the problem type person? What happens when you go through a storm? Well, look at Facebook. What happens if you tend to be super self-confident and cocky and kind of look down at people who are fearful? Then you get ever so much more so. Now let me make you a real challenge. What happens if you're a person who walks in faith, loves Jesus and trusts him? What happens in a storm? You should get ever so much more so. Right? So I think that part of the purpose of storms 
is that it reveals what's inside the cup. That the storm doesn't make you do that. The storm simply reveals what's already there, which is ultimately part of God's love for us because it's only when you reveal it and admit it and deal with what's really inside, that's the only way that you can actually deal with it or let God deal with it. So storms have a great tendency to reveal what's going on. It was funny because we were talking about social distancing and, you know, not hugging each other and all that. And one of my introvert friends like, finally, you guys, <laughs> finally you're getting on board. So if you tend to be somebody who isolates, what happens in a storm? Ever so much more so, right? That all of our tendencies can be emphasized when we're in a storm. So the question is, how should we respond? We are in a storm. The disciples didn't plan their way into a storm. They followed Jesus into a storm. They followed his directions exactly. And where did they end up? In the middle of a storm, in the middle of a lake, in the middle of the night. Sometimes we think we sort of imply that if you really follow Jesus, your life will be fine. And the reality is is that following Jesus can lead you right into the middle of a storm. Partly because he's wanting to use the storm to develop us and to cause us to grow. So how should we respond Well, first of all, the thing that comes out strongly from this is that we should respond knowing who is the storm master. Knowing who is the master of all of the difficulties. Who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And you see, the disciples knew he was the master of dividing the loaves and fish, but they didn't know he was the master of the waves yet. Now, they had already had a demonstration. This was storm on the Galilee 2.0. Chapter 4, they'd already been there. But they're responding, and it says they're still terrified. And honestly, this was a little deeper test. This was a little bit more of a struggle. And so it says, Jesus comes walking to them on the water. Isn't it interesting how that particular phrase is one of the things that we pick up about Jesus that shows us that he is so much different than we are. If somebody gets, like, too big for their britches, you say, well, at least they're still not trying to walk on water, right? Right? And this is a lake that's about, about six miles wide. So if they're in the middle of the lake, he's walking on the water for a long ways. This wasn't like two or three steps. He's out there in the middle of the lake, in the middle of a storm, and he's walking on water. And can you imagine why that would terrify them? So Jesus is more than you think. Every time you get a better picture of who he is and how powerful he is and how great he is, you're still only just getting a piece of it. And so God takes us through his experiences partly so that he can reveal himself. Because you see, you don't need a storm master unless there's a storm. You don't need a wave walker unless you're out there in the middle of the lake and Jesus isn't with you yet. And so we we see a new picture of who Jesus is. And what that means is that we need to be, instead of caught in the storm, he says, take courage, it is I. He doesn't say, take courage, I will take care of the storm, even though he eventually does that. He doesn't even promise that the storm will go away yet. He says, take courage, which means doing what's right even when you're afraid. That's what courage is. And people think courage means you never feel afraid. That's not true. Courage is when you step out to do what God calls you to do, even when you feel afraid. So he says, take courage, it is I. And isn't that the wonderful theme all the way through the scriptures? I will not fear, for you are with me. That the promise of Jesus is not that the storms won't come or that he will immediately cause them to subside when you pray. The promise of Jesus is I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am with you in the storm. So then he climbed into the boat with them, and then the wind died down. So the storm is not only a great test of our faith, it is a great opportunity. It is a great opportunity for us to first of all say, what's really going on inside of me? What is the storm causing to be shown about where my heart really is before this? So you didn't plan this storm. We don't know how the storm is going to turn out. We don't know what the long-term effects of the storm are going to be. But what we can know is that Jesus is in the storm with us. So the first thing that should do is that that should cause us to go back to the scriptures. I hope you have a couple of very important 
key scriptures that when things in your life feel like the wheels are coming off, you go back and you read your top 10. And if you don't have your top 10 yet, you need to find them. Because there's wonderful things about discovering the truth of God's word for the first time, but there's something so reassuring by going back to those places where you've been deeply impacted in the past and saying, oh yeah. So here's one of my scriptures. Don't be anxious about anything. I wish it were a little less clear, don't you? Because what we usually read that is, don't be anxious about little things, right? But the truth is we need it more in the big things. But in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So he says, don't let anxiety get the better of you. Now fear is when there's usually something directly you're afraid of and you're responding to it. If you're being chased by a guy with a knife, that's fear. But in the middle of the night when you wake up and everything in your life culminates and all these things going on and it just starts eating you up inside, that's anxiety. And he says, instead of letting anxiety control you, pray. What if every time anxiety kicked in, you started immediately saying, God, I need to take this to you. I need to pray. (laughs) What if you were to pray as often as you surf the news for what's going on latest with the coronavirus. Or looked at this pundit or that teacher or that statement or that doctor. And part of what we do when we get afraid is we focus on the fear and the fear producing things, which does nothing more than intensify it. And he says, instead of focusing on the problem, I want you to focus on me. So he says, we need to be praying. And can I suggest a couple things you pray about? Can I suggest maybe confession starts off? Confessing where you have not understood what God's already done for you, so you're living in fear. Confessing where you've been insensitive to the fears of others. Confessing where you have been angry with people. I'm amazed at how much anger this is kicking off. I ran into a guy in the grocery store who I know is a prepper, and he was going around and talking about... The, how the media was trying to kill the president, and he was, rrr, 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 you know. And I, I met him on another aisle, and I said, how much food do you have stored? Because I kind of knew the answer to this. He said, five years. But if I have to feed my kids, I guess it'll be less than that. <laughs> His kids are grown, by the way, but <laughs> it's not as bad as it sounds. But here he is, completely prepared for the absolute worst, and his life is a torrent of anger and fear and struggle. He says, I think we need to pray. First of all, maybe confess what the storm shows about our hearts. Yeah, God, you're right. Man, I have been so anxious. I've been so fearful. I've been so angry. I've been so whatever you've been so. And then maybe we need to move the next part where she says, with thanksgiving. See, one of the wonderful treatments for anxiety is to go back and review the goodness of God in your life. You see, faith is always a history lesson. What has God done? That's why we have so many stories in here. That's why so many of the stories are about people so much like us, so human and so fallible, because we say, wow, if God can do that with Peter, I guess he can work with me. Right? And we go back and we review the goodness of God. And can I say you need to make it personal? Go back and review what God's done for you. The storms he's taken you through. The ways he's answered your prayers. The way he's poured his goodness into you more than you and I deserve. And when you spend time reviewing the goodness of God in the past, it changes your perception on the present. And I think it's interesting. Then he says, with petition. Is it wrong to pray about all the things that are bothering us? No. I think you should pray for the people who are trying to make decisions at every level of our culture. I think you should pray for church leaders trying to make decisions. I think you should pray for people you know are impacted. Pray for your finances. Pray for the things that are bothering you. But instead of fretting about them, ask God to take care of them. Which doesn't mean he's going to come immediately and solve it right then. But it's it's a matter of handing it off. It says you present your request to God. And this time of prayer, this time 
is to be a time of changing your heart and getting yourself refocused and then taking those concerns and those requests to God. You know, I think it's interesting. The book of Mark doesn't tell us the other part of this story, but you remember what happens when Jesus comes walking across the water and they had been toiling all night and they're in the middle of the storm and Peter says, if it's really you, Lord, call me and I'll come. Now, we make fun of Peter, but let me tell you, in his impetuousness, he had a lot of faith. I don't know about you, but as little as security as that boat offered, I would have stayed in the boat. Right? And he says, let me come walking on the water. And he climbs out, and he starts walking towards Jesus on the water. An incredible experience. And then the next line says, and then he started looking at the waves. See, even when we start by faith and we trust in Jesus, it's so easy to get distracted by the waves, especially when we spend all our time focusing on all the outlets and what everybody's saying, what everything, is, everything that's happening and all the losses that maybe we're going through because of the, of the storm. And as soon as he took his eyes off Jesus, what happened? You remember what Peter means? He started swimming like a stone. That's what Peter did as soon as he took his eyes off Jesus. Peter means rock. And isn't it interesting? He was buoyant as long as he was focused on Jesus. After that, he was left to his own devices and he sunk. And of course, Jesus reached out and, she, and he grabs him. So let me encourage you to pray more than you worry. Let anxiety be a, a call to you to prayer. What if you had the picture that Jesus was going to go on by until you call out to him and say, help, come, come, get in the boat with us. I encourage you to pray about whatever it is that's concerning you or whoever it is that's concerning you because it's easy, as I said, to get focused on how everybody else is responding instead of re this or reacting to that instead of to Jesus. And then secondly, I think it's wise to prepare. There are some things that have been suggested, and I wish this had come out earlier in the crisis, but there is a very logical strategy towards social distancing, which is about lowering the, the rate of the first, what they, what they call the curve of going into a, an epidemic. And the faster it goes and the steeper it goes, for one, the more our health system is overwhelmed. In fact, there are people that are going in for very real needs that are waiting for hours over people who think they might have a virus, but there's really no way to tell. So the idea of just trying to slow the spread of the disease, to lower that curve, that makes good sense. That's not just fear-mongering. And so you can do whatever you decide about how careful you want to be, but there's some good preparation you can make for yourself. Um, you can... Take some of the suggestions that are talked about, about washing your hands, for example, about how much do you go to places. And I think we should be careful. A lot of times when we say careful, the first thing we think is protecting me. But I think you also need to be careful who you are carrying something to, that potentially you could be taking something that doesn't bother you, because they say a lot of people are going to have very mild symptoms. And so you get off easy, but you hand it to somebody who's immunocompromised and and it could be fatal or, you know, difficult for them. So I think in the middle of that, God wants us to prepare wisely, to don't be foolish. You remember when Satan tempted Jesus and said, jump off the temple, God will catch you. And Jesus said, don't tempt the Lord your God. So there's a, there's a good place for that. I, I saw this quote, and it was uh, on Facebook to start with, and then I went and found it. And Martin Luther in 1527 was facing the plague. They did not understand exactly how it was transmitted, but it is deadly. And in Wittenberg, where he lived, it was causing people to die right and left. And so they asked him the question, should Christians flee the plague? And he wrote a whole letter about his own response. And he says, well, you ought to think this way. By God's decree, the enemy has sent us poison but I shall ask God to mercifully protect us. Then I shall fumigate, which is what they thought would help keep their homes clear. I shall help purify the air. I shall administer medicine and I shall take it. 
I'll avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance to infect and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me. <laughs> and I have done what is expected of me and I'm not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. And then he said, if my neighbor needs me, however, I will not avoid place or person, but I will go freely. And in fact, Martin and his wife, Catherine, opened their home to those who were sick and didn't have anybody to care for them. And they became a hospital in a city that was dying. And I think there's a wonderful piece in that that says, I'm gonna trust God. He's with me in the storm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hear that, that I'm not gonna give in to fear. I'm gonna try to do what's wise, whatever I can do to protect myself, to not be a danger to others, to take reasonable precautions. I'm gonna do those things. But the third part of it then is, I also need to plan to prepare to help others. You see, Sometimes we have this funny piece that, a picture that the church is only when there's a group gathered on the weekends in a building called a church. But you know what? We are the church. And we are the church when we are gathered and we are the church when we're deployed. And in fact, we're probably far more effective when we're deployed than we are when we're gathered. And so there are people around you that are more scared than you can believe. There are people that are struggling. There are people that are sick. There are people that need help. And uh, what's beautiful about it is that sometimes in a storm, there are people who are interested in Jesus that would never be interested outside of the storm. And when they begin to see the result of that verse in Philippians 4, it says, and then the peace of God, which transcends understanding. It'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, if we pray instead of worry, if we focus on what God's called us to do, instead of giving in to the currents around us, then he said, the peace of God, which passes all understanding. And I love that phrase, because I don't know if you've noticed, but fear is not particularly logical. Panic has no reasons and rules. In fact, if you have somebody who's terrified of airplanes, you can show them all the statistics on airplanes and the fact that you're actually in greater danger when you drive on the freeway to get there than you are once you get in the plane. And you know what? When that plane gets ready to take off, it doesn't help them a bit. Why? Because you're not matching logic with something that's logical. In fact, I think that's why prayer is so powerful, is that it's a matter of not just trying to logic yourself out of fear, it's a matter of turning it over to the one who can take care of it. Fear at the bottom level is often a spiritual thing. And the beautiful part about it is that if people can see us operating in the peace that passes understanding, while they're in the midst of panic, they might be more interested in your Jesus. Because you see, I think people ask two questions. Is it true? But the second question they ask is, does it work? Does having a relationship with Jesus change your life in a demonstrable way? Can I see what following Jesus looks like? And we did a funeral yesterday here, and, and I don't know that it was, would have been that effective, but there was some believers in a neighborhood that were part of the person who died and they brought all of their neighbors and they said, oh, I'm so glad we got our neighbors here because they got to hear the gospel. But they had been planting the seeds of love and care for years before that. And now they're gonna go home and they're gonna follow up on that and say, did you hear what was said and how do you respond to that and are you a follower of Jesus? So you see, it's, it's the church embedded in our communities that can be the most effective in a storm. And so, we encourage you to do the things we've been talking about doing. There's signs out in the lobby you can pick up and you can put it in front of your house and you can declare yourself to be a follower of Jesus because we live in a world of darkness and we serve a Jesus who's got power over the darkness. And it's just like with the bumper stickers. If you're gonna put a bumper sticker on, then drive like a Christian. If you're gonna put a sign in your yard, Live like a Christian. That should be the same as this is a safe place. This is a place of hope. This is a place of peace. This is where we follow Jesus instead of the currents of our culture. And so we encourage you to pick those out. And, and actually, we encourage you to write some names on a card and to be praying for people as we head up to Easter. And you know what? There may be some people on your list that are far more interested now than they were before. Why? Because they're in a storm. And in a storm... <laughs> 
Jesus looks a lot better walking on the water in the storm than he does when you don't need him. So what can we do? How can we respond to all of this? Well, the first part, I think, is personal. Guard your hearts and your minds. Let the peace of God rule in your life. In fact, it says build a garrison around. It guards, like like put a, a platoon of soldiers around your heart. And I like why it says guard your hearts and your mind. The scripture tells us to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus. And you see, your, your mind is where you begin focusing on that, those anxious thoughts, and then it settles down into your heart, which is the seat of your decision-making and of your actions. So we say, okay, God, help me guard my heart. And when I worry, I'm going to pray instead. And when I get tempted to go look at all the news media and focus on all those things, God, I'm going to take some of those great Bible verses, and I'm going to go back over those, because honestly, that'll get you a lot further down the road. So guard your hearts and your minds. Do what you can do. And then I hope that you take that to heart and say, God, now that my heart is at peace, who are some other people I can help? I hope that after you pray for people, you text them and say, I know that you're sick. Can I drop some groceries on your porch? Can I meet a need? Can I take somebody to the doctor? Can I watch your kids? And and by the way, the kids are going to be off school for two weeks, so by the second week, I'm sure some some intervention may be necessary in some homes near you. But ask yourself, instead of what is the world going to do to me, ask yourself, what does Jesus want me to do in this world? And I think out of that, the storm builds our faith. And we walk away stronger and better. And this storm will pass. The question is, how do we respond to it? How do we have relationships in it? And how do we see somebody's life change because of it? Let me pray for us. God, I think it's important for to say thank you for the storm. Thank you for the crises that come that reveal our hearts and show us where we still need to grow. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunities you give us in the middle of this to experience a peace that doesn't make any sense. God, thank you for your great peace in the middle of the storm. And help us to be kind and caring to those who are struggling around us. Help us not to make fun of people who are more fearful than they should be or to react to people who are more angry than they should be. Help us to be bringers of peace because of your peace that's in us. And God, after the storm is over, we hope that there are people that come to know you out of the storm and that therefore the eternal has been impacted by the temporary. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me or if you'd like to let us know, um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.